Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the Capitol will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -oh. Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? The roads. <laughs> you boys like Mexico! I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! Welcome back, everybody. Taxation is theft. And uh, we've got an interesting show for you today. Thomas Kittel is with us. <laughs> I just found out his name is French, so I'm having fun with my French accent. How you doing, Dan? I'm doing good, man. Good to have you on. Um, so to anybody who doesn't know, Thomas is uh, he's he's a big behind-the-scenes guy on the Berman 2020 campaign. He's a huge help. Um, thank you for everything you do. Oh, well, I'm doing it for uh, my own reasons. I want the country to get better. I want people in my situation to be better. Selfish bastard. Right. <laughs> for your own <laughs> reasons, for what you want. Sure you want know. the world to be a better place. <laughs> you libertarians with your selfishness, you disgust me. Oh. Uh. Um, yeah, so we, we love messing around. Um, but don't worry, we actually do do work when we're working on the campaign it's not all fun and games it is lots of hard work going after the state and pointing out all of its faults well no it's actually not that hard to point out all of its faults but uh that part's pretty easy it's hard to list them all uh, yeah that part is hard um so uh yeah so thomas um Tell us about yourself. You're into so much, and we've got some we've got some important issues we're going to talk about um, uh, in a little bit. But uh, but yeah, just introduce yourself. You've got I don't even know how because you've got like so many interesting things going on. Well, I uh, I was born with osteogenesis imperfecta. Type three is the diagnosis. I was originally diagnosed as type two. Um, which the only difference here is viability, meaning they, they expect me to die soon after birth. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm from New York, and I know what these fingers are for. Um, and I didn't. The, uh, the last time I heard anybody say how long I would live, it was age 21, and they, they really don't try to do any of that to me anymore. They've given up. Um, the interesting thing is, for most of my life, like many other people in similar situations, um, I was led to believe that the government systems are the only things that can help me. Um, and, and doing for yourself. I mean, my family always did for themselves in a lot of ways. But when it came to getting a wheelchair or a medical treatment, the price tags on those make it seem impossible. Um, but I'll tell you what, in the last five years or so, I've come a long way in uh, getting out of that. Um, started out with, I wanted to uh, be able to drive a vehicle and make a life. And some years ago, some friends crowdfunded and uh, through a fundraiser, and they, they were able to raise quite a bit of money, and we did get a vehicle with a lift. Uh, <laughs> the only hitch there is... Um, the driver training program, which is a, a state program um, that I was in the middle of, said that uh, the vehicle that worked for me was no longer uh, serviceable. I mean, they got rid of it. And they replaced it with a fleet of vehicles with driver's seat rolling away so that somebody in a wheelchair can pull up into it, right? Uh, couldn't do that. But I did get a vehicle to transport, which is important. My next experience with crowdfunding for myself um, was while well, I'm sitting in it. it, it it's a wheelchair. Um, 
when my previous wheelchair, which you see sitting right there, um, was no longer usable, I went to uh, start going through the system to get another one. And what I had found out was that the uh, rules set forth by the ACA and how New York handled that basically stated that my private insurance, which is expensive and through a union, because um, I'm a dependent upon my mother, and she is a union worker, would no longer pay for a chair anywhere near that quality. And there's an interesting fact to that. No other chair has suspension like mine. This is a spring from the kind of wheelchair that I'm in. And I can't, I can't bend it. it it's, it's up there with what you put on the four-wheeler. And that's a good suspension. Um, other wheelchairs don't have a good suspension. Um, and I have brittle bones. That's what my condition does. So can you imagine living in a rural area without a good suspension? I mean, it's not doable. So I ended up um, stuck in my house for a few years. And I have a lot of experience with wearing this specific wheelchair. As you can see, there's even another chassis over there in that corner. Uh, those are both my old chairs, saved for parts because they haven't changed in 21 years. And um, I had a nice little eBay alert set up on my phone for parts. Um, the name is Omega Track with just a C, so it's a very unique name. And uh, parts do come up, and so I, I searched eBay for parts. And then a whole chair came up, and it was, uh, it was listed for a little over $4,000. And in total, between creating and shipping, it costs us about six and a half thousand dollars. Now, here's the thing: it's six and a half thousand dollars to get a chair that has an air ride suspension on top of the spring I just showed you, and impact struts. And that there's three forms of suspension. Um, it'll tell intercline, so if I'm injured or otherwise need to uh, kick back, um, that's handy. You even got a safety horn. I don't know if that came through the mic, but uh, yeah, it's a <laughs> Now, we got that for approximately $6,500. What the state would pay for that wouldn't work and would actually injure me to, to sit in for a, a prolonged period of time uh, would cost $19,000. Um, that's what they would pay. So they, they were willing to pay $19,000 for something that wouldn't work. And they're now not willing to pay for what does work. And you see a lot of this depending on the situation and different things for different disabilities. At one point, uh, even before I was going after a new chair, I, I was told the only cushion I could get is an off the rack ergonomic cushion, which is built for normally shaped people. I'm not normally shaped. And uh, that, that also would have injured me. I mean, there's so much to that. But the long story short here is you don't need those systems. You don't. I mean, think about it. Uh, this is actually originally in the 90s when it was built, it would have been about a $60,000 to $65,000 chair. And we got it for about 6500 And it had about three days' worth of use on it. Now, now, this, this is something. That's, like uh, that's like a Corvette. Yeah. So what? And and like I'm guessing this thing doesn't go that fast. Why? Why is something know. like this so expensive? If like it's, I mean, obviously it's a you know it's a it's it's a technologically advanced piece of equipment. It's not you know just a regular wheelchair. But um, well, it's actually not that technically advanced. It's no more technically advanced than you're riding lawnmower. Probably less. Really. Yeah. I mean, it's two basic electric motors, a basic uh, oil bath transaxle, like similar to what's in a lawnmower. Pretty well, I guess. Uh, how are the suspensions on those? Because I think some of those, some of those uh, mowers are just like seats <coughs> well, on springs, and that's about it. Yeah, a mower wouldn't have that suspension, but this suspension is is definitely. Um, I mean, it's not on, sixty thousand uh, dollars worth. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars worth. I mean, your hat says it all, man. Um, there's a lot of business taxes involved. Um, I mean, this spring, 
made out of a metal, right? So the foundry was uh, was taxed. And uh, then the, the ingots were sold to a company that probably made the spring, and that was taxed. Same with the paint that's on it. And then it was shipped, and, and that was taxed. And then it got to the, the company who, who built the chair, and that's going to be taxed. Um, and then it's going to be shipped again, and that's going to be taxed. Um, so there's a big chunk. Not to now, mention are there, uh, what about like uh, regulations and that sort of thing? That would be the next one. There are a lot of horribly expensive safety regulations that actually do nothing for your safety. Um, this is the only brand of, of power wheelchair I've been in in my life, which it's been 32 years now uh, since I was four, that didn't inadvertently come close to killing me uh, from malfunction. And an interesting statistic, I um, can't remember the website I got it from, but it's a, it's a consumer goods statistic, right? Uh, the most dangerous consumer items. Wheelchairs consistently make it in the top 30. Guns do not. Think about that. Wheelchairs are statistically more dangerous than guns in this country. Wow. That's insane. Um, two of them took off on full speed and ran me one into a door frame and one into a the table I was breaking my legs both times um, I, I mean just just think about that we're putting our most vulnerable people in these death traps um, and, and people think they're great and you know if you're uh, if you're not physically frail and you're intelligent enough to keep up your strength and your activity then a wheelchair is wonderful um, you know of course if you're Disability doesn't allow you to keep up your strength and activity. That's one thing. And you need a different kind of seating system. But um, they most often are designed with the thought that we will do nothing. Um, and I'm not that kind of person. <laughs> the the um, mentality that not having the ability or the opportunity to attain our own accomplishments and therefore self-worth kind of lends itself to the industry chair. Um, I mean, this chair was designed by a quadriplegic, I believe, quad or para, uh, and his father. And they were aeronautics engineers, actually, for the military. Um, and he, they were sick of not having chairs that you could do stuff with. So they built one. And that was originally Tef Tech in San Antonio. Uh, and I believe the company moved to Austin. And they had the usual growing pains problems that the company do. And sold the line to another company. And they degraded the design a little bit, but still the best chair on the market. We sold it then again to another company. The same thing happened. It degraded a little bit, still the best chair on the market. Um, I mean, I can climb a six-inch curb slowly and not feel it. That sounds like a lot. And, and people think, oh, well, you've got a tank. That's great. It's like a four-wheel. You can go anywhere. I mean, you know what? True, true, true. It'll go a lot of places. But I tell you what, I don't want to go there. <laughs> Bouncing is not good for somebody who is uh, as brittle as I am. And right. so my main point here is if the system is failing, you do not give up. Do not give up. Find another way. This wheelchair was 20 years old with only three days of use. And if I hadn't found it, well, my friends hadn't encouraged me to, to crowdfund and, and we got it that way, it would have gone to the dump. That's what happens. You, know, you have very, very expensive equipment that the government pays for on tax dollars. It's used a little bit. Somebody either can't use it as well as they thought, doesn't like it. Maybe their condition worsens real quick and Maybe they try to sell it once, but to the dump it goes. We really need to either incentivize or remove any restrictions on anybody who's trying to closet and give this stuff away. That that really needs to be done because right. it's to burn away. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's interesting that they have so like. So, so the reason they wouldn't cover your chair was it because it wasn't a specific model that was on a list that they had, 
or was but it because it, it, it was used? It's price cap. It's price cap. Um, everything follows Medicare guidelines in New York now, even private insurance. But it was so, less than. It was less than the other one that they wanted to pay for. Well, this was because it was used and sold on eBay. And so they wouldn't, but they wouldn't give you the money to buy it used on eBay. No, 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 because uh, it has to come through like a certified dealer or something, right? Yeah, um, I grew up with basically, and they're not intended to be threats, but they are threats of um, warranty and repair. You know, we won't repair it if uh, you, you repair it yourself. And right. you know, we're 90 minutes from the nearest good repair spot, let alone if your insurance covers that, because you play that game too. Not every, um, not every chair service company will take your insurance. They think it might take insurance, but you know, they pick and choose. Right. Um, so I, I, in my life, I have waited up to 18 months for a wheelchair and something like six or eight for a simple repair. Now, that one there, all that needed was um, some sprockets that are very cheap. Um, the motor is rebuilt, which I get that done for 100 bucks myself. That, that's, that's not bad. Um, and, and right now, it, we're looking at the transmission. It's still giving a little bit of a problem, but it's probably repairable. Right? But here, here's another hint. After five years, insurance companies in New York, at least, are not required to to repair your wheelchair. So if they've spent $65,000 on your wheelchair, they won't pay 500 to repair it, but they'll let you get a new one, that 19,000. Okay, so like from the insurance, like I'm an insurance company and you come to me and you tell me, I either have to pay you 500 to fix it or 65,000 to buy a new one. I'm going to go with the 500. Why, why aren't these companies doing that? Well, I don't have like on paper proof, but uh, it's pretty well known that insurance companies invest in things mm -hmm. as do any hospital conglomerate. Most, most big companies are investing in things and they do it smart. Um, if you were an insurance company purchasing healthcare equipment that you were required to cover, where would you want to invest? Healthcare equipment. Well, right, but uh, I don't know. How does that work? Because if they're spending sixty-five grand on a new chair, and yeah, they're making profit by selling that, but they're not really making profit. It's if it's the same money that they have to pay. Well, I understand that, but the reason they won't let you buy used equipment is that part makes sense. Convoluted. Right. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense if you can't buy used equipment. But I would think Yeah, that's strange. Yeah, personally, just not through a system, whether it's insurance or the government. And or I I mean and, and they don't have like a huge deductible on these things, do they? There's almost no deductible on my insurance. So it's, it's not like they're they're gouging you there. I don't know. That's it's definitely strange. But I mean, I agree. There has to be like some kind of swindle going on because that just doesn't make any sense. Well, if you really want to hear about a swindle, um, can you guess what the batteries for this would cost? They're they're fifty pounds, and there's two of them, and they're twelve volt deep cycle gel the, cell batteries. Like the car batteries, right? Or bigger. Not bigger, not bad, not much bigger. I they couldn't be much more than like a hundred bucks. Okay, um, for a set to buy through a wheelchair repair or a service company, I believe they like to call them providers. It makes it sound more official. Um, Twenty four hundred was the last time I priced them up. Wow. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing is, is that's the same. This is your, your insurance company will pay that twenty four hundred dollars. Right. And what kind of batteries are these? <clears throat> They're gel cell sealed deep cycle batteries. Same ones they use electric forklifts and golf carts, which we're getting to. Uh, the interesting thing is, is you get them through the system. Um, what they do with batteries when they're bad is they can actually put them on a cycle that will re-increase their life again, but only so far. 
And there's generation stickers on these, basically a coding system to know how many times that's been done. And getting batteries to the system, I've often gotten them with a lower generation rating over a higher generation rating sticker. <laughs> so, so that they're basically lying and they were bad batteries. Wow. Um, you go to a, well, three years ago was the last time I bought batteries. And I got them from a golf cart supply store. They sell golf carts as well. 400 bucks for a pair, same brand, same rating, same kind, same, I mean, same factory, maybe right next to each other online. And, uh, you know, when I get them through a provider, they might last me six to 12 months. These batteries are pushing three years old. Now, what did I pay for them at the uh, golf cart company? Four hundred dollars for two. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's. I mean, look, I, and and I get this with like, you know, Epson does this with their ink cartridges, right? They they sell you a printer for a hundred dollars, and then the ink lasts for five pages, and and it's like fifty bucks for a new set of ink. Like it's cheaper to buy a new printer. Um, but what's interesting is the ink itself is so inexpensive that you have you have refill kits that will sell you a gallon of ink for twenty bucks, um, and so they started putting in. Uh, Apple did the same thing too. Um, so so these guys started putting chips in the printer cartridges so that you couldn't make bootleg printer cartridges, and once it ran out, you couldn't refill it because the chip wouldn't reset itself. Apple did that with their um, with their phone chargers. Because they didn't want people to make bootleg phone chargers, um, they wanted to sell theirs for thirty bucks, and and they knew all the you know all the other third party companies would make them for like five bucks, and those are the ones you get at the gas stations. And for the longest time, um, this is one of the reasons I, I stopped using Apple for for phones. Um, I don't know if they still do this, but for the longest time, if you get those cheap cables, um, they'll work. They'll charge your phone, unless. Um, your software pops up and says this cable is not compatible. And so you're like, the, the, the cable's working. It's getting electricity to your phone, but your phone's saying, oh, it's not made by Apple, so we're not going to actually let you charge anything with this. It's ridiculous. When I, when I was a kid, uh, some of the wheelchairs would have their own bit style on the nuts or on the bolts or screws. Uh, so you actually had to use their tools, which they only supplied to the provider. Right. Yeah, Apple does that too with their little. They use the little five star screws and everything. But uh, so okay, so so here's the flip side of that, right? That's that's normal kind of capitalism shit, right? Um, that's 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 the greedy capitalist that's always trying to scam the consumer to make them spend more. Okay, fine. Because um, as libertarians, we're kind of we're kind of in favor of that just because it's free market. But at the same time, when you're mixing government into regulating oh but you have to buy because now you have like now it's not just the okay let's say the chair company says you have to buy your batteries from us if you don't buy your batteries from us we'll kill your warranty or something okay fine that's that's their deal that's what you agreed to when you bought their chair but when the government comes in and says you know oh well we're only going to cover certain things and we're only going to pay for certain things and you have to buy the more expensive crap in order for us to pay for it and all that gets paid for by the um by taxpayers and, and all this other nonsense then that's where you get into like the more coercive nonsense and so if you look at these two systems yeah the greedy capitalist trying to rip you off is a form it's kind of a form of extortion but not really. But then when the government comes in and gets involved, then it's like, yeah, no, you're just you're just looting and pillaging and, and screwing everybody over who's got nothing to do with it. You're screwing over the taxpayer who's not even a part of this contract. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what that does? Uh, and many people in my situation, we, we understand that uh, the system screws the taxpayer. We understand that the price tags are inflated and way too high for what it's worth and that other people are paying for that. And so what you see is you'll see people quiet up. They, they, they'll, they'll not ask for what they need. They'll, they'll choose to suffer over a simple solution. Well, that's no good either. No, but that's what happens because it's oppression. 
you, you put this force and this pressure that only the government can do it. And you know how expensive, and the person involved, this is me I'm talking about, um, I'm just starting to get over the guilt I've always been riddled with just for my position of being a taxpayer funded life, right? Um, no, I have a very large family. Imagine if they all, you know, kept that 30% every paycheck. My life would be a lot better. This wouldn't have not seemed like a struggle. Um, so the important thing to remember is that you can find your own solutions. You know, if the system is not helping you, you know, you're not, you're not beholden. They haven't got you in a cage. Even if you're stuck in your own home and your wheelchair is not working, you're, you're, you're not locked up. You can ask for help. You can ask your family. You can ask your friends. You can get on the internet. You can do some research. You can try to find what it is what you need. You can even try to build it, which interestingly enough, about $700 worth of the shipping charge was the crate for the wheelchair, which is on a skid. Now, that skid is now a work platform so that we can work on it better. Um, and beyond that, I've made uh, had a friend of mine make an exercise bike. Now, to purchase that out of, say, a catalog or through the system, it would cost a lot. We made it with garbage. We made it with garbage. Something to throw away. We turned it into something. Um, wheelchairs can be the same way. You can fix them. Um, a friend of mine with a machine shop made the gears that transfer the force from the motor to the transmission that I need to replace. He just made them. That's how cheap they were to make. Yeah. That, you, all you have to do is ask and find the right people and sources. Um, right. Now, what's what's interesting about that is is IRS rules. Oh, shit. Sorry, my dogs are going crazy over here and just tripped over my cable. And pulled my camera out. But um, while that's coming back up... Um, uh, no, I don't even know what I was going to say. <laughs> Freaking dogs. Guys, leave me alone. I'm trying to do a show here. Just give me another Stay 30 minutes. Here. We'll go for a walk. Oh, come on. <laughs> 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 all right, there we go. Um, all right, what did you say right before that? I believe I was talking oh. about... Uh... Uh, this is what I was going to say. IRS. Okay, so uh, according to the IRS rules, uh, this example was, was given to me before. Um, if, if I cut your lawn, hold on. If I cut my own lawn and you cut your own lawn, then neither of us have benefited, so we're, we, there's no income. If I cut your lawn and you cut my lawn, well, then I received a gift worth, you know, whatever, 20, 50 bucks. And you received a gift and we're both supposed to report 20 or $50 income and pay tax on that. Now, when you talk about having a friend down the street manufacture something for you, well, that manufacturing, that those raw materials. Now, of course, there's, there's, they're gifts. So up to a certain amount, it's, you, you could argue it's, uh, it's, it's a gift, right? Um, if your tax accountant is smart enough, but it's, it's, it's so ridiculous that, that that's the way that's supposed to go. And what's even more interesting is, so, so there's this idea, right? If let's say, let's say you had a physical good, right? Let's say you had a banana worth $150,000. Um, is it duct tape to the wall? Yeah. <laughs> and I have an orange worth $150,000 duct tape to a wall. Um, if, if we were to trade those, what's interesting is I could say I gained a banana, but I deducted an orange, and you can deduct that. You're, you can't deduct your labor. So if somebody gives you something in exchange for you doing something for them, like if you cut my grass in exchange for me doing something for you, I, I have to that, – that receipt of the grass-cutting service is taxable – but what I did to earn that, since it was labor, is not deductible. 
labor is not deductible. Because here's the thing, if labor were deductible, then you'd be able to deduct all of the hours that you spend at your job and you wouldn't have to pay taxes on your income. That's that's the way they look at it. It's, it's a whole bunch of nonsense. Um, but um, but yeah, so it's it, my, my point is that even though you're trying to do things on your own, without government, without without them in your way, and I'm I'm well, I don't want to make any uh, accusations, but I'm hoping you didn't pay taxes on any of that. Um, you don't have to admit anything, of course. But um, I mean, I think eBay requires a certain amount of tax. Well, yeah, eBay. Well, uh, no. It, well, it depends. They might charge a sales tax, um, which is different. I don't think they charge an income tax because that's going to go through PayPal. Although if you PayPal is considered like a credit card processor and they have rules on that. If you do more than, I think, I think it has to be both 500 transactions and $10,000. If you pass that threshold, they're reporting everything that went into your PayPal account to the yeah. IRS. And then you're paying taxes yeah. on it's that makes um, sense. yeah it's it's you know and, well, and that's what they do with with uh, all credit card processors so you go to target yeah target's got more than 500 transactions and more than ten thousand dollars every year so um all of their credit card transactions get reported to the irs so that of course they can match that with their records and and make sure but what's interesting is technically target doesn't have to report its uh its cash earnings right Except that it's a, it's a huge corporation, so of course they want like, you know, the man, upper management wants to micromanage the the store management to make sure they're getting profits from every single penny that comes out of there. And because of that, it, it's too big of an organization to keep two separate uh, sets of books. Um, it, it all gets reported anyway. But technically, an organization like that wouldn't have to. And you'll see a lot of mom and pop shops that, you know, they take cash and and it doesn't get. Uh, doesn't get registered yeah, the healthcare market particularly something like wheelchairs is, is not easy to enter um anymore that's for sure you can't just go oh i want to build a wheelchair and, and do it in this country and it's um, it, why not right because it's got to be what fda approved or yeah there's there's coding approval for the various systems there's testing you have to do well you have to pay somebody else to do whether or not they actually do it yeah um I mean, I, I had a wheelchair built for <clears throat> rugged outdoor use fall apart after three months. I mean, so that tells you how good the safety standards are. And this one was certified. This one was FDA approved. Yeah, was the system. I was, uh, I don't know, 13 or 14 when I got it. It's called the Quickie P300. Um, and it, it's notorious for having the problem with the falling apart uh, now. <clears throat> but uh, these things don't get reported as often as other consumer goods because there's always an easy excuse and I'm sitting right here. Um, they blame the person using the wheelchair. Um, the first time I had a wheelchair take off on me, everybody thought that I just get the controller and then the second time I was actually in school and in the lunch line and it took off in reverse and, and hit a bunch of people. And again, I got blamed. Um, and then that same wheelchair took off and, and ran me in the door frame, broke my, my lower leg. So that it went like that. Um, and, and that was witnessed and they finally believed me. And what it was, was they had a, an electrical switch that used mercury. And, and that was uh, actually technically supposed to be banned even then uh, because mercury is volatile to both heat and impact. If you're taking your wheelchair in and out of doors, you're using in a rural setting, and it's going to suffer both heat and impact. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the safety standards that they say are on wheelchair, they sound nice. It's not all warm and fuzzy, but they really just drive up the price and, and don't keep you safe. Wow. Yep. That's, I'm, I'm just trying to, like, picture, like, how, what kind of mercury like a mercury switch kind of thing yeah that's just what i was told at the time i mean i was a kid uh that was an interesting lawsuit um 
but by the time I was uh, at the deposition, I was like 14 or 15 and, you know, still very injured, head full of Vicodin. And I'm, I'm a kid, you know, my arms and legs are in, in bandages and, and I'm full of opiates. And I've got three high paid corporate attorneys on the other side of the table from me. And one was from the insurance company, one was from the seating system company, and then the other was from the chair company. Uh, and they're all trying to blame each other, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they do. But think about that. I, I'm a child. I'm hauled in to deposition while injured. <laughs> I, I don't even understand why it took that much. I mean, how do you not look at that situation? You just understand it's wrong. But um, right. an interesting thing that happened was, well, You've probably noticed that I'm pretty good with my grammar. Mm -hmm. um, you forget what he said or the way he said it. And I, I'm still to this day not sure if it was intentional that he said it this way or not. But basically, he asked a question in a way that contained a, a uh, either intentionally hidden or easily mistakable double negative. This was a lawyer? Was being, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was intentional. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I, haven't uh, heard it yet. Yeah, I don't like to make those, those things, but, uh, you know, I assume it was probably intentional because, you know, he's a lawyer dealing with a child who's in a wheelchair. I mean, you can just imagine the judgment from his perspective, um, especially in the 90s. Now, I kind of called him on on it, and my lawyer loved it. He, he he put his feet on the desk and leaned his chair back and his hands behind his head. Uh, and I actually ended up feeling like sorry for the guy because he was embarrassed. You know, so here he is in front of two colleagues that he doesn't really know well, you know, and and he's he's turning his red as a strawberry. The poor guy was balls. It was funny. So, so mean, what was the question? I, I forget exactly. I, I really do forget the question exactly, but. Uh, I just remember that it contained a double negative because I got to actually quote my teacher from the year before. <laughs> and, and so your lawyer didn't pick up on it? I was too quick. Okay. I was going to say, because I mean, like, you know, this is... It, if your if lawyer didn't pick up on it... On, caught on it. No, nobody else in the room caught it. I, I mean, if, if, if he wouldn't have picked up on it, even if, if I would time up on it, it would have read back from the stenographer sheet wrong. It, it would have read, it read back in a way that I would not have intended to answer. Right. That, you know what? This is why a lot of times when I ask, when, when people ask me questions and the question itself isn't clear, I like, I don't give a simple yes or no. I just, I just start from scratch and answer their question by telling the story um, because, because yeah, I mean, it, it really is as simple as that. Well, were you, or were you not blah, 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 somewhere in the middle of the night? Yes. It's like, okay, wait, so did you just admit that you were, or did you just deny that you weren't or deny that you, yeah. yeah. Um, or that's a, that's another one. Right? Do you deny that you were not there? Wait, y yes, no, wait, do I deny that I was not there? Like it's, it's exactly Your example that. Sounds like a cop to me than a lawyer, but yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. And that, but, but that's the thing. Like cops do that because they know that and they've learned that from their trials, from their lawyers. But actually, police officers are, are, are taught to use those. Um, right. Methods. Yeah, exactly. Because they know, they, they know that's how that works. Um, they're, I mean, I just, don't mean to talk bad about the police either because I have several friends who are police officers. And I, I trust right. them in my but um but i mean that's that's how they work that's it's it's you know how do you get an easy conviction is i mean that's you know when they say we're just doing our jobs their job is to get the evidence they need to hand over to the district attorney to get a conviction conviction that oh, is their job ultimately their job is to justify their job right that too yeah um so, so yeah well we the the point i was going to bring up about this is when when you go and you get a public defender like or, or you have your this, this is what i tell anybody whether you have a public defender or you have a lawyer you have to be your own advocate 
don't expect them to just do everything for you because they're not going to catch things. Their life is not on the line. They have their own personal life. They might be they might be in there trying to defend you, and, and all they've got in the, on their mind is the hot date they had last night or the breakup they just had. Like and, you know, It's the same if you have a disability. You have to be your own advocate. You can't just trust your doctor. You can't just trust the people who are in your who are taking care of you. You can't just trust the facility and you can't just trust the government facility. You have to be aware right. and you have to know yourself. I, I saw this little article where the, the, they made some cute little teddy bear to go over the um, infusion bag for some little girl who was sick. And, and it was like to make her not afraid. Or, you know, I, I understand the feels on that and then that you might want to comfort her. But here's the fact. That girl is sick. She's always going to be sick and she needs to learn to deal with it. And if she doesn't, her life is going to be hell. And, you know, hiding an IV bag is one thing, but that mentality is strong in the world, you know. Right. Um, and, and, you know, you can't. Well, and this is like, you see a lot of people too that, I mean, we have really, really common diseases like heart disease, diabetes, um, obesity, and, depression and what do you do you go to a doctor who's like well let's see you could start exercising you could try a better diet you could try to no they don't tell you that because well for one they know most people aren't going to bother listening so they just say okay what kind of drugs do you want and you end up with blood thinners for your for your heart condition which is like no get some exercise and eat healthier and your entire circulatory system is going to be better. But it's like, no, just just make your blood thinner so it flows through easier. Your your arteries are all clogged up. We know you're not going to actually do anything about that. But like that's absolutely wrong. And if you're not your own advocate and the doctor's just taking the easy way out or maybe he's selling you medication cuz he's getting a kickback from the pharmaceutical company, whatever the case, if you're not if you're not your own advocate, if you're not trying to like, if you're not asking those questions, well, is there a better way? Is there is this gonna is this a cure or is this gonna be a, just a pill that I'm gonna take for the rest of my life? Yeah, I actually found the uh, the treatment that that took my bone density from um, seven deviations below normal to be a negative nine on their scale. I, I don't even really understand it very well, uh, but uh, I, I found that treatment and it was experimental. And I went to my doctor and and he helped me get in the program. And now it's no longer experimental, and I'm still on it. And it took my fracture rate from over 100 a year to less than one a year. Um, but I wouldn't have that if I hadn't done my own research. Right. Yeah, all, you got to, always. Um, I mean, doctors back, are... Back, back, back to that wheelchair that fell apart. Um, the wheel fell off and threw me out of the ground. I had well over 100 fractures documented from the waist up. My legs were so broken, the doctors really didn't want to put me through the x-rays. Um, what do you think that would be worth in a lawsuit? Hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Yeah, actually, the original lawsuit was $6 million. Um, but at the time in New York, if you were a child, you, you were viewed as less valuable because they, they have these nice little well, charts that they have, uh, it's basically based on your expected income in life. <clears throat> so if you're a child, you, you were valued as less. And if you had a disability, you were valued as less. And what we came out of that with was about $45,000. My parents went through hell, uh, e even more than me, in my own opinion. Um, that's, and, that's less than yeah. 1%. Yeah, that's not much more than what the wheelchair cost. Wow. Yep. Um, and, I, and I guarantee you they didn't reimburse my insurance company either. That's it, Yeah, that's insane. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that tells you that the state is judging me as worthless. Even when I was a right. child, and this is and this is coming from the government. This isn't coming from. This yeah, isn't they have a number coming from the company who doesn't want to pay. I mean, of course, they use that because they they don't want to pay. But this is coming from the government. The, the government, who's always got our back, 
who's always got our best interests in mind. That government. Yeah. So uh, on the government that has our best interests in mind, I sent you some links um, earlier mm. so that we could discuss them. Yeah. Do you have the Iowa link? Um, let me, um, I totally, I totally screwed up. Hang on a second. I'm going to, let me get those open here. And I was just going to, I figured out how I was going to do it. All right. Which one do you want to start with? You want to start with one of the police videos? No, let's start with Iowa. The Which one? Iowa. The, uh, ah. the, the last one I sent you. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Give me one second here. I'm pulling this up here. And... There we go. And sorry, give me one more second here. All right. I have this on screen. Am I, should I play the video? Yeah, if you can, go ahead. Can I hear it when you do it? Um, I don't know. Let's find out. I don't know if our viewers can hear it. No, they cannot. Well, let's talk about it anyhow, as you can show it. And you, I mean, if the image is up, you can see the facility looks a lot like a prison. Yeah, we're, we're here we go. So... Hang on a second. Let me just give me give me one second here because I think I can pretty quickly just get this in here. Um, let's do this because then you can hear it, and then we'll all be we'll all be happy here. Safari, and that's gonna go here. All right, tell me if you can hear this now. Department of Public Safety to, yep. quote, assist All in right. reviewing additional allegations made in the course of her fact-finding efforts. The Department of Human Services will continue to be transparent and provide updates as this unfolds, being careful not to jeopardize any aspect of the investigation. The U.S. Department of Justice is already investigating and sent a letter to Governor Kim Reynolds last month saying it is specifically looking into claims that the facility performed sexual arousal and optimal hygiene hydration studies on residents. We are working with the DOJ doing everything that we can, so, first of all, to make sure that the residents right, me, are getting the care here. that they Hang need and that they are being taken. All right. Um, so did you hear that? Yeah. Sexual arousal and hydration experiments. I, I, I don't even really want to picture what that means, but it, that that's insane. Yeah. Um, so a hydration experiment would be either restricting or over hydrating right. a person. Um, to what extent, who knows? But uh, if that's an experiment and they're doing it to people involuntarily, that's incredibly wrong. That's exactly like what the Nazis did. Interestingly enough, um, <clears throat> I had three bones removed from my body, cut into pieces. Um, they shoved metal rods down the middle of those bones, and then they put them back in, starting at uh, 18 months old. And that was based on a Superman experiment um, that the Nazis did. You know, they were trying to make Superman stronger men. Mm -hmm. this um, it's also what Wolverine is based on. And here's what happens with that procedure. <clears throat> if you have a weak bone like I do, they can't screw into it, so they can't hold that rod in place. Then they come out slowly on their own as you grow. Um, I lucked out. Mine were always caught and removed, um, but uh, I, I knew one person who was a doctor uh, when, when they called frantically because the rod was protruding from her arm, um, told her mother to pull it out. Think about that. Wow. Um, and these experiments are largely failed 
And uh, they are better than what they used to do to people with a lie. And I can only talk about my own situation as well because it's what I know most. Um, I met another person who, who he had it and his mother had it. And in the 70s, um, they cut his mother's legs off because they were crooked. And she's dealt with phantom pains and opiate addiction since. Um, another thing they used to do was uh, experiments with high mineral supplementation, which uh, puts you through all kinds of internal organ distress and disease. Um, but these experiments, a lot of these medical advances, they're, they're, they're actually on the backs of the weak. Um, sometimes it's voluntary, and that's okay. If you're willing to take the risk and you choose it, that's another thing. But if you're in a home that's being done to you, like in this Iowa case, that's wrong. So what what are the conditions of this Iowa? Like what kind of people are here and why are they here? Well, it's called a resource center, which means it's and it's the Department of Health Services. So there's a quote. Um, it's uh, going to be those with disabilities and those who are elderly and you know otherwise infirm, right? So kind of like the the ward of the state type thing where yeah nobody yeah. nobody can take care of them. They can't take care of themselves. They've got the state says that's not always true. So what's what, what kind of conditions would like? How could someone get in there? Well, you can be dropped off by your family if you are taken care of by your family and they feel they no longer can or they've been convinced by somebody that they can't. You know, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the stress in those situations that uh, cause people to not go uh, cared for in the community, are, they're actually false. Uh, the stress is false. The, uh, the thought that you can't do it is false. The thought that if the government doesn't give you what you need to do it, you can't have it. That's false. Um, and so you, you, you have people who are, you know, they're taking the easy way out. Uh, humanity flows like water. We find those easily traveled paths. And, you know, when you're dealing with a situation this difficult and the government comes along and says, oh, we can make it all better. It really doesn't matter if it's a lie. People will believe it. And in right. fact, um, this is not a new thing, the abuse of the disabled under the, set, under the state. Um, but disability rights were spawned not far from me uh, at the same time as the civil rights movement. Um, but nobody really hears about the disability rights movement as much. So the real problem is thinking that you can't do it yourself or thinking that there's no one who can help you if the government says it all. And that's what we're running into, right? We're, we're seeing this socialized healthcare getting forced through and it's getting worse and worse and it's making people give up. And what happens when you give up with a disability? You die. It gets worse. You need to, uh, you need to have that attitude. You need to be strong. You need to uh, you need to look at the doctor. You need to say, well, you say six months, I say three, right? That's how long it's going to take me to heal instead of uh, six. Um, your attitude is everything, and the government is essentially diminishing the sheer will by which we have always survived. Thousands of years, humanity has survived in instances of hardship through sheer will and the government is taking that away from us right yeah I mean, it's, it's it, it really ha and they do it in i mean it's they do it in so many ways i mean this is this is the education system this is um the job system the retirement system it's <laughs> It, it, the welfare system take away all of your incentives just uh just just check the boxes and everything's going to be all right we're going to take care of you yeah box checking is a big problem i mean that's how you end up with blanket standards for health care too i mean uh my feet are literally upside down <laughs> and my knees point to the side 
And at one point, you know, it was mandated that you could only get an ergonomic seat cushion. Think about that. Ergonomic. For who? Right. That's um, like the, so uh... it's, interesting, it's interesting you mentioned the uh, school system because I sent you another link. Um, Massachusetts, do you have that one handy? Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't know if you're going to want to play the sound on that one, but go ahead. I'm willing if you are. Teen being shocked. Yep. Well, I swear on this show all the time, so I guess we can have a little bit of screaming. Um, I guess I should say, everyone be warned. Screams of pain from a student at the Judge Rotenberg Center as he's tied down and shocked for hours. Good evening, I'm Mark Ockerblum. I'm Maria Stefanos. Fox Undercover's camera, the only one in court today as a jury is given its first look at that disturbing video. Our investigative reporter, Mike Baudet, in that court today. He's here now to give us the latest. What do you have, Mike? Maria, this is the video that the Judge Rotenberg Center in Canton has fought long and hard to keep from the public eye. The center convinced a judge eight years ago to seal it, and the battle continued right up until it was played in court as lawyers for the center asked a judge to bar our camera from recording it. Well, the judge said no. And now for the first time ever, the public can see for itself what these controversial electric shocks look like in use. So is this kid like tied to the floor? It looks like. So that's a, it's like a table on the floor. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's a table. All right. Dramatic video of New York teenager Andre McCollins restrained face down, a helmet on his head, screaming for help. The Judge Rotenberg Center calls it treatment. I was shocked when we were 16 or 17. Thirty-one that day. As McCollins' attorney just described, and hang on a second, let me. 30... There are. I'm. Ch I guess some of these are chairs, but there's one, two, three, four people standing around watching this. Yeah, you notice they drag. Right. Yeah, like this As is McCollins this is normal. As attorney them. just described, the teenager was shocked 31 times in all that day in 2002. McCollins is suing the Canton-based center, calling it torture. Yeah, Lawyers for the center and its clinicians say McCollins needed aversive therapy because he was aggressive. These are dramatic tapes. There's no questions. He so he was being aggressive, supposedly. They're still doing it. They're and, still shocking kids. This like, okay, like this is on so many levels. Okay, if someone's being aggressive, then yes maybe restrain them defend yourself against them well you, you notice the size difference between that kid and those people right you say that again you notice the size difference between the child being electrocuted and the people around him uh, it, it's hard to tell since i mean he, he's still a child they're grown adults yes yeah, i mean yes i mean of course that's yeah but it's uh, he's, he's already restrained what the fuck are they doing? They think they're training him to take off his jacket when they tell him to. Wow. I mean, uh, okay, so they're trying to train him like a dog to do something that's absolutely arbitrary. Based it's on an extremely a antiquated approach that's no longer used anywhere else in this country. And in fact, it's not used in any school, which this was. Uh, on Earth, this is a school. This is a public school. This is a public school. This is a government facility. Disabilities. This is a kid with disabilities. Uh, he has autism. Uh, do you know what autism does to your senses? Jesus. Okay. Oh. Did, okay. <laughs> I'm getting pissed off now. Um. I hope everybody watching is getting pissed off. And, and, and so this is... Wait, wait, wait for me. Now, people in this country are willing to boogaloo over a magazine limit, but yet we can kill our infirmed, we can torture our children, and we can do experiments in the helpless, and nobody wants to boogaloo? That pisses me off. I, I, 
I, yeah, no, I I agree with you. Um, were, were were these kids? Was this kids? Were this? I can't even. I can't, I can't even. Think my grammar. I'm pissed off right now. Were his parents aware that this was going on, or was this? Yeah. They were. They were not. Oh, they weren't. So okay. So this is the state telling her that. Uh, this is where your kid should go because this is where we can help him and you're not capable. And she bought into that nice fairy tale. And really what they did was they electrocuted him. Okay. So they, they. Yeah, those voltages, by the way, are more than the police use of violent offenders. Okay. Is, is this like, I want to know how, how much did they cover their asses legally? Was this like when they put their kid here because you know, they're threatened they're threatened into believing this is the only place your kid belongs here sign this waiver was there did they have legal authority to do this without the parents consent or did the parents that's a good question did the parents uh, unknowingly give consent they may have unknowingly given consent i mean all parents unknowingly give consent the minute they send their kid to school yeah no that's absolutely true you know what here's this this blew my mind the other day because i was thinking about this because you have Okay, you have the mandatory school thing, right? You have to send your kids to school. If you don't, it's child neglect. It's all this, this and that, right? Yeah, pretty much. How do they know if you have kids? Well, you go to the hospital when you give birth, and they have a birth certificate, so they'll track you. For, but that's that. That doesn't. That's not really how it works. Because how do they know you didn't just move out of state, right? So just because you gave birth to somebody in Mount Upton, New York, um. The Mount Upton School District is not going to be like, oh, well, three years ago, a child was uh, delivered at the hospital and is not showing up in our school system. Let's go to the home of that family and kick the door in and make sure that, you know, let's punish them. I don't um, think that happens. I think anybody who... Uh, CPS can cause you problems if you're not sending uh, your children to school and somebody says something. Right. Basically. But, oh, if somebody says, okay, yeah, that's a different story. If somebody rats you out. Um, Which could be anybody, really. Right. I mean, hopefully, hopefully in that situation, you're smart enough to say your kid's on homeschool at least. But this, so, but so, this is the point I was getting at. When the schools do this, because we know the truancy police go around, they threaten parents, we're going to arrest you if your kids don't show up at school. And I could be wrong about this, but it is my belief that that only happens if you have registered your child with that school in the first place because otherwise that school district the the truancy offers and officers and everything you, you're not in that system they're you're not on their radar they're not looking for you out of my league my school didn't even have truancy officers <laughs> <laughs> well lucky you um okay i'm gonna i'm gonna finish playing this video is there, is there more to this one there is all right i'm gonna i'm gonna keep playing this but the treatment plan at the Rottenberg Center and the treatment plan that Andre had in place on October 25 was followed. It was an emotional day for McCollin's mother, Cheryl, who was in court as video was played from the beginning of Andre's ordeal when he was shocked and restrained after refusing to take off his coat. Can you back it up? Can you back it up, please? Holy shit. I never signed up for him to be tortured. Okay, now, no. Terrorized. Hold Wait on. for it. They, they, I want to hear what she has to say, but I, I just want to point this out. This kid was sitting in the chair, facing yeah, they, a computer. Uh, they have packs that they put on them. Um, they, it's like a battery operated backpack with but, wires to the. Uh, but this is the point. About you, you said something about he was being aggressive, and that like that's their whole excuse to this, right? Supposedly. He's sitting in a fucking chair looking at a computer screen. How much less aggressive can you be? Yeah. I, you're going to get more mad. All right. Preparing myself mentally. And abused. I had no idea. No idea that they tortured the children in the school. Cheryl testified what her son was like when she visited him three days later. I couldn't turn Andre's head to the left 
to the right. He was just staring straight. I took my hands and I went like this. He didn't blink. Now, Sarah McCollins did get Andre to... Is it like... <sighs> okay. Tell me that's not trauma. What's that? Tell me that's not trauma. It, it, like, it, it, is there not even, like, some degree where, like, this kid is possibly blaming his mom for sending him there? Um, I mean, because he doesn't... It, Really, he doesn't know. He doesn't it, know it, if she's aware of it or not. Well, uh, from personal experience with regular public school that I was forced to go to, but my parents wanted me to have equal opportunity that I never got. Um, I, I can tell you that, yes, it, it, if you're aware of the situation enough, which I, I don't know this kid, um, yeah, yeah, you will transfer that blame to your parents because it feels like they're the ones who make you. But they only make you because they'll get in trouble if they don't. Right. But I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, how did this conversation go? She's having a conversation with her son. Well, um, we're going to we're going to trans. You're going to go to a different school because we think that's best for you. And you're going to meet new friends and things are going to be a little bit different. OK, here's your first day at school. Have fun. And then you walk in there and then they're zapping the shit out of you because you won't take your jacket off. Yeah. Thirty one times. And again, that's with voltages higher than what they use for violent offenders higher than what the police have in their stun guns that are specifically for meth heads. All right. Um, should I keep playing this one? Yes. All Please. right. It's going to get worse. Children's Hospital that day where he was diagnosed with acute stress response caused by the shocks. We should see more of that video Wednesday in court as Cheryl McCollins returns to the witness stand. Maria? Mike, I got to tell you, that, that was some tough video to watch. What Absolutely. was it like in the courtroom? Well, it certainly seemed like it got the jury's attention, and the defense obviously knows that video is disturbing to look at. It certainly did not help the defense case when Cheryl McCollins testified about watching the video and hearing staff members laughing, laughing, that's right, while her son was on the Think floor. About Mike Bodette. All right. Thank you, Mike. Wow. That's... Right. So those staff members are, are, are equally indoctrinated. They're put into positions of authority. They are taught that they are the authority. They are taught that what they're doing is the thing to do. And then it becomes normal, so normal, they can laugh at electrocuting a black autistic child 31 times in one day for not removing a jacket. This video is uploaded April 15th, tax day, wonderful, um, 2012. Yep. So it's been up there for seven and a wow. half years. Yep. And it's only got 9,000 views. Yeah. Nobody cares. Is what, what channel is this? Urgent info. I wonder, I don't know. Maybe it's just a small channel. I wonder if the maybe actual longer clips of that video, there, there's one that's really horrible that I didn't send you. Um, <clears throat> sorry. It's a little hard. So if you know anything about autism, you know that various sensations or senses uh, can be extreme, like the sense of smell or the wrong texture of a touch can really freak out somebody sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. A sensory disorder. And they're electrocuting a child with an extreme sensory disorder. How do you think that's felt? I mean, you, we can all imagine it would feel bad enough if we were electrocuted. But if your sensory system is extra sensitive. Right. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, um, this is this is insane. All right. So we've got another video here. Uh, I'm going to jump into this one. Um, yeah, this one apply, kind of applies to everybody. 15 year old with no arms or legs, tackled and pinned by a sheriff's deputy. So I'm I'm guessing this the sheriff obviously sensed this this teenager with no arms and no legs was a threat to his life and had to use necessary force. 
only on KOLD News 13 tonight. We are getting a look at explosive new video of a controversial arrest involving a Pima County Sheriff's deputy and a 15 year old who has no legs or arms. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Maris and I'm Brooke Wagner. This video shows the deputy wrestling the teen to the floor. We do want to warn you the video you're about to see could be disturbing to watch. KOLD News 13's Bud Foster joining us live at the Sheriff's Office along Vincent Highway with more. Bud. Well, Dan, I showed that video to the Pima County Sheriff's Department just a little while ago. They had not seen the video before, and once they watched it, they did begin an internal investigation. Now, this incident happened a couple of months. Say that again. So he just stated that the police hadn't seen it until he showed it to him. Right. That's a reporter. Right. I mean, so so nobody reported this. Right, and this is interesting because I've I've seen uh, I've seen plenty of times people going to the police department, and sometimes they record it. And here's the thing: when we see a recording of it, it's happened a thousand times before, exactly the same way. We're only seeing just the person who happened to record it, who got pissed off enough to record it. People go to the police and say and why why did the reporter take the video to the police is it possible that the the kid who recorded this tried to go to the police tried to file a report and the police said well we're not going to take your report you're not serious well, cons you considering this is basically a home for people who are taken by cps troubled views um then yeah it's you're, absolutely you're a and minor you play the rest of the video you're, you're a minor come back and have your parents fill out the the complaint for you Sorry, I can't. I have no arms and legs and my parents abandoned me. Well, well, I'm sorry. Maybe you should get an attorney. Like, this is, like, I have seen the police pull this bullshit. Oh, the chief of police isn't here right now, so you can't file a report. You can only file it with the chief. Oh, well, yeah. let me talk to the chief. Oh, he's in a meeting right now. He's not here. Like, nonsense. Complete nonsense. And what's, what's even more interesting is, like, there are laws that say if somebody comes in with a complaint, they have to take it. And they know this and they know once that complaint is taken and once it's on paper, it's in the system and that really screws them up. So they yeah, will intimidate I people. They, they will intimidate people so they just don't take those forms. So they just don't fill them out. Well, can you tell me what your complaint is before we give you the form? We have to make sure it's a legitimate complaint. That doesn't sound like a legitimate complaint. I'm not going to give you the form. Wow. Yeah. That's what happens. All right, let's, yeah. let's go back to this. Go, but that video is just now coming to light. We were able to get our hands on it today, and as you said, it's going to be rather explosive. And then they have an exchange, and he gets in his face. And he curses at him. You consider that egregious? Yes, absolutely. Imagine you're this boy with no limbs who just got tackled by this large man with a badge and gun, and this man is now screaming in your face, and he's now threatening your friend who has the temerity to record this whole incident. Absolutely, that's egregious. Get the f off of me. The eight minute video begins with a deputy on top of the 15 year old boy, wrestling him to the floor with shouting and swearing. Later, it also shows that same deputy arrest the 16 year old boy who shot most of the video. He's eating the bowl of cereal. He puts the bowl of cereal down. He puts his hand behind his back. Hey, look at and now the deputy's going to slam his head into the wall. He's, he's already like breaking his arm. Point and is not trying to resist arrest. It doesn't look like he's doing anything. Just for good measure, let's slam his head into the wall. We watched the video with the public defender, Joel Feinman, and with his chief assistant, Megan Page, in their office. I would be horrified if an officer treated my children this way. And these kids are already in the traumatic situation of being in DCS custody and they're not even in a stable home environment. So I think it's absolutely horrific. We showed the video to the Pima County Sheriff's Department Internal Affairs late this afternoon, which would not allow us to tape that. It was the first time the department had seen the okay. video. It was not aware that it even existed. I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about that for a second. So. He arrested the boy, took the video, and yet they're not aware it existed. Right, okay. They went in to file the complaint. The officer comes out. This is what happens if, if anyone's ever been through this process. You file a complaint. They set you up a meeting with internal affairs, which is it sounds like that's what this meeting was where they were showing the video. They put on a recorder. They record everything. They record the entire conversation. You give them the story. They write a report. 
This is all the stuff that goes on. The news was not allowed to bring a camera in there to record this exchange, even though the government, the people who were receiving the complaint, were, like I, they're recording the entire thing, right? Now remember this, because this is this is what this is what the government does, right? This is what the police do. Everything you you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Now tell me everything. Tell me the whole story. Yep. And then, yep. but meanwhile, while you're telling them the whole story, they don't even want their reaction filmed. Yeah. They don't. They don't want their reaction filmed. This is the, government operates in secrecy, even at this lowest level of a local police department just receiving a complaint about about one of their own officers. So there are some more articles out there about this story, and you can find some more information. And, and what I remember reading was this boy had recently been abandoned at this um, facility, um, or abandoned by someone and put in this facility, and he was having a temper tantrum. I mean, he's in a wheelchair, he's got no arms and legs, and he's stuck in basically a juvenile detention center. I mean, I, I don't care if you think this is like a, a care center for children, but let's face it, in these situations, those are not good places to be. And he, he was throwing a, a temper tantrum. I believe what I read was he, he, he knocked over a garbage can in the set. And so some somebody thought that, oh, well, the cops are going to handle this appropriately. And because of his disability or whatever reason, they didn't want to be the one to handle. Somebody made a phone call. Or he was already there for another reason. Right. It's hard to tell. But people think that the police will know what to do. And, you know, um, interestingly enough, in my own situation, even EMTs are a bad, a bad idea. I'll never call 911. No. Because they throw people like cordwood and I'm brittle. <laughs> right. All right. Let's, um, I'm going to keep this thing going. And as would be expected, they were noncommittal. It's difficult to really predict, but obviously there are, there are a number of, of, outcomes that could that could occur um, following an internal affairs investigation. Meantime, the public defender's office says it's rare that videos such as this make daylight. Usually they get buried. So when one does see Usually sunshine, they get buried. it's a rare teaching moment. Men with badges and guns should not be acting this way. Yes. And that men and women who do act this way should not have badges and guns. Yes. Hey, that's an interesting now, point. Now those two I'm... teenagers were arrested. They were taken to yeah. So, uh, you you remember the 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 police officer that um, see the department that wouldn't hire him for having too high of an IQ? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what his IQ was? One twenty. One oh one. One oh one. Okay. You know what the average IQ is? One hundred by design, right? Yeah. Um, now, why? Why do they not, why in a system of so many rules, laws, and procedures, and having to you know so many different ways of handling so many different people that you're going to encounter as a police officer, why are they looking for stupid people, or people of lesser intelligence, or people with lower IQ? Why would they do that? I'm, I can imagine two reasons. One, they're willing to put their lives in stupid situations, and two, <laughs> they're better or, order followers. Yes, uh, they are easier to hand down rules to. Uh, the Army likes them, whereas uh, the, the Navy and the Air Force, uh, they, they look for a, a more, you know, when they're trying to figure out where to put you or, or trying to lead you into making that choice. Um, if you're, if you're pick stuff up and put stuff down kind of big guy, they want you in the Army. And, and if you're more technical, it's probably the Air Force. And they do the same thing to police officers. Now, um, I don't know how much you know about that other case where the boy was electrocuted, um, but there are articles out there, and, and I read one that said that when that went up through the courts, the judge ruled that that treatment met the standard of care. In Massachusetts, I, I mean, so we're back into our legal system here. The judge ruled that electrocuting an autistic child 31 times for not removing his coat was uh, meeting the standard of care. Wow. Um, 
And, and again, that's the state. That's the state. They forced that through. I'm sorry. They forced that through. I don't care what kind of a, a, a soft, fuzzy feeling you get from it, but they forced that through. And in New York, I have a perfect example. Why it doesn't take me forever to find it? Um, nah, it should be pretty easy. While you're looking for that, I'm gonna I want to play the last minute of this video. Juvenile old jail and booked for disorderly conduct. That case right now is being prosecuted by the Pima County Attorney's Office. Now I'm going to talk to one of those young boys tomorrow. They're in school, so we have to sort of work around that. And the Pima County Sheriff's Office told us late this afternoon that that internal investigation would probably take a couple of weeks. Dan, Brooke? And Bud, you mentioned that you could not film us watching their reaction there with the sheriff's department as they watch that video for the first time. But no you were in the cameras. room, correct? Well, yes, and, and these men are professionals, and they're very stoic. They didn't show any emotion, but I tell you what, they watched every moment of that video. They watched it very intently, that's and the then thin after blue it was line. over. That's, that's the thin blue line right there. When he says these guys are professionals, they were very stoic. They're able to watch a video of one of their brothers beating the shit out of somebody who is absolutely defenseless, and they can't even cringe. They can't even say, oh, my God, that's so much. He shouldn't have done that. That's terrible. They have well, no he's got that uniform and that badge, man, that makes it okay, right? It's it. This literally is when they pick you up. If you're a member of the gang, when they pick you up, you don't say shit. They tell you anything that happened, you didn't know anything about it. You keep your mouth shut, you don't know anything. That is how the police act when one of their own brothers does something criminal like this. Oh, you mean maybe they act like a gang? Absolutely. Now, of course, um, I don't so wanna, let me read you I don't want to be anti-cop, but... This is actually so from... This is from the mission statement of a nonprofit in New York, and I'm not going to tell you which nonprofit, um, but it's under their goals as far as government operations. It states that the disability community desperately needs a voice in state government that represents all people with disabilities. Reinstating the office for the advocate for persons with disabilities is a critical first step. Originally established by Mario Cuomo um, via executive order, the office was responsible for advising and assisting the governor in developing policies designed to help meet the needs of people with disabilities and serving as the state's coordinator for the implementation of Federal Rehab Act 73, which would now include the ADA and the Olmstead Act. Um, now, here's this. As one of his first acts in office, um, Mario Cuomo uh, continued Executive Order, Order 26, or Andrew Cuomo. Uh, however, despite the existence of the office on the books, yeah, so Andrew Cuomo reinstated it, right? So despite the fact that this office exists on the books, any advocacy function in state government disappeared when the Justice Center reorganized itself without any advocacy functions. A new home for advocacy and independent living must be established. So basically what that's telling you is our governor is making decisions for those who are infirmed, the elderly, and those with disabilities, that he is making those sweeping decisions in his state without any advice. Governor Cuomo does not want advice on what people in these situations need. He does not want to know. All he wants is money. And he just recently cut $75 million from the CDPAP, which is basically home nursing care. Um, he got seventy-five million from that budget with no advice. He has no advisor on this. The only advisor is is the Almighty Dollar, um, which you know in New York I'm all for it not being tax dollars. But if you think about the way he and states policies and the way the ACA has gone through this state and the fact that that I can't get a wheelchair and that they want people to die quicker because it's, it's, it's cheaper for the people who are paying them. <laughs> you just think about all of this at once. How can everybody sit around 
feeling healthy, thinking that it doesn't apply to them. And that's what happens. Uh, th this government has fooled the American people into thinking they will uh, never be one of those people who, who are caught up in this. And the fact is, it's everybody. Uh, by age 65, 42.8% of people, and that's an old statistic, have a relatively severe condition of some kind that could be considered a disability. Um, what's your retirement age, Dan? What's your retirement age? What's, sorry, what was that? What's the retirement age? The retirement age? Um, what is it, 65 for Social Security? Yeah, yeah so, so by the time... Everybody retires. Forty two point eight percent of them have a disability. Right. And, and I was just thinking about that as you were talking, because people saying like that, that's not going to happen to me. So many people expect to be on Social Security, retire on Social Security. And oh, yeah, when I retire, they're going to be they're going to send me a check every month. I'm not going to have to work. I'm going to have all this money. That, that shit. I know so many. OK, here I have a friend who was receiving Social Security wasn't a whole lot. And first of all, this is this is not something you want to retire on. I mean, this is something that barely covers your rent, if that. Um, I had a friend who was who was on Social Security, as is, is my friend's grandfather. He's receiving his his monthly check. He pays his rent with it. He he lived with his wife. And all of a sudden the so he pays his rent, he writes his check. The landlord calls him back. Your your check bounced. What would happen? The Social Security gets deposited every month. What's the problem? Well, it turns out Social Social Security had been overpaying him something like 50 bucks a month for the past yeah, so like him. couple years. So instead of depositing money into his account, so he already had the money there. He knew the money was there so he could pay his rent. Instead of depositing the next month in there, they took two or three months out. They emptied out his account because they had been overpaying him. No warning, yeah. no letter. Yep. Um, actually, that, that happened to me uh, right after I turned 18 and the check went to me instead of my parents. Um, what happened was uh, they, they told me that they overpaid my parents through the 90s. And, and so my check was lowered in, in the amount uh, every month. Um, I don't remember how much or whatever, but uh, they told me that twice for the same period of time, meaning that they, they, I went through two periods of having less in my check than, than the prescribed amount uh, over the same amount of overpayment. So basically, they, they billed me twice in a way, uh, which means they billed taxpayers twice. Um, <clears throat> so the other interesting thing is, is that if you get, in, if you get married, um, you get half the amount or less of the amount, anyhow, depending on your state. Um, if two people with disabilities get married, they both get less. Does that make sense? Nope. So they're involved into a system that will screw them every which way and feel defenseless. It's, yeah. it's insane. It's yeah, insane. This is this and, is, and you know what? I'm going to put one message out there, one message for every politician who might ever hear this, see this, whatever. Uh, history judges societies based on how they treated their weakest. That is a fact. Yep. All right, man. Well, um, I, uh, I'm i sure we could talk about this all night. Um, yeah. But... Uh, um, well, let me leave you one more thing. Yeah. I'm supposed to be dead more times than I can even list the count. And I've been in so many hard situations you don't even want to know. But if you keep your perseverance, if you keep your attitude, if you keep your strength, if you never give up, if you don't stop, there is a way. You know, for anybody in a bad situation, right? We just talked about a lot of horrible things. Anybody watching is probably very sad. But I'm going to tell you what, there's a way. There's always a way. And... If you know someone who's in a position and, and maybe they feel like there's no way for them, or maybe they feel like they have no hope, if you're able to help that person do so or offer it, and you know, sometimes your time is way more valuable than your money. Sometimes talking to somebody is the best thing you can do. Um, and that's also the best way to learn what they need 
and what would help them and, and how to help them with their happiness. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that I went from uh, being stuck in my home, being depressed, uh, looking at going to a bed for the rest of my life, which probably wouldn't have been longer, and in about six months' time or less, through some volunteerism and some help from friends and family and a little perseverance, and, and I've got what I need, and I can be happy again. So you do not have to give up. The government not helping you is not a reason to give up. Right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We should stop expecting them to. Um, we know they do a terrible job. They don't care about us. The, the customer service agents don't know us and don't care about us. Um, they're just there doing their job. The, the, the representatives and senators and, and lawmakers, they've never met us. They don't care about us. Um, yeah, we, we really need to stop even expecting anything from them. That, sh that shouldn't even be the first place we go to look. Um, and, and I know, look, it's difficult. Things come up all the time, and especially when the government's breathing down your breathing down your neck, taking everything you have. Oh, your, your tags are expired on your car. You owe us another couple hundred dollars. Well, I have no more money left. Would you well, go to the state and get some money from them? This is like we... We have to stop giving in to them. We have to stop giving them money for shit that they don't deserve. If you don't have any money and they're extorting you over license plate fees and everything, fuck them. We got to find ways out of this. That is not right. And then they leave and you with you nothing. Have disability, you have to self-educate. You have to tell people what it is you need. You have to talk about it. Don't stay quiet. Don't be embarrassed. Don't feel like they're going to think you're ungrateful. Do what you need. Pursue your happiness. That's your fundamental right. Absolutely. All right, Tom, is there anything uh, you want to direct anyone to, website, Facebook page, anything? Not especially. No, I, I just want everybody to know that, you know, you, you don't have to eat the shit they serve you. You you can find your own way. And, you know, I'm going to give one last shout out to the social workers out there. Um you know, quite often they are good people who got into what they do, not for money, but because they do care and they end up suffering through a system that doesn't let them help where they know they should. Right. Yeah. They that's... actually undergo a severe amount of psychological. Um, that's, um, yeah. That, that's an important one, too, because I, I hear about this all the time about. Um, when uh, where was it where was it um there was a there was a story i was reading about I, I think it had to do with katrina where there were people who were able to help and they were getting stand down orders i think it happened in the in hurricane harvey um i'm pretty sure it happened when there was a hurricane up there in new york and people like not even people working for the government non-government people were setting up their own like medical facilities to help people because they was just like everybody's in the streets everyone's going crazy no one's got any place to go and there was in the government's shutting them down. Um, people working for the there was one, something about a helicopter and the helicopter wanted they wanted to go pick people up and, and shuttle them back and forth to the Superdome or something. And they were they were receiving stand down orders. No, you're not supposed to pick people up. People who are stranded on, on roofs or whatever. No, stand well, down. God forbid we help each other, then we have less need for government. Yeah, it's it's totally fucking backwards so forget about government learn how to survive on your own learn how to take care of yourself your family your community everybody else and um Look, i'm living proof that you can set your own broken bones you can wrap your own broken arms you, uh, I've, I've cured my own abscess tooth i make the flu go away in about three or four days and i do this all without the medical system or the government and don't wait until you need them to figure out how to live without them. Plan on they aren't going to help you. If you're expecting them to take care of your retirement, don't. You're gonna be hit with a really bad surprise and that and it's gonna to be too late to do anything about it unless you wanna keep working when you're 60 or 70 or 80. Which you see that happening now everywhere. Yep, yeah. Yeah, you see this, you see this all the time. There's like, you know, you go to like a, a CVS and there's somebody who's like 80 years old working there. What, what about their social security? Aren't they supposed to be retired? What's 
why why is that even a thing? Apparently, the social security program is not working. No, it's it, it's largely stolen. I mean, the Cuomos, um, Andrew and his dad. I think it's something like eight billion they've stolen from New Yorkers in social security. I believe it. All right, man. It's been awesome. Keep um, going. Taxation is theft. We'll see you guys next time. So I hope this hope this episode wasn't too much of a downer. <laughs> I, hey, well, you know, leave off with the hope. You know, I'm still here. I mean, you can still be here, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um, it's it's stuff we got to know about. We we have to understand that the state is not there to help us. So sometimes you got to get pissed off a little bit before you can uh, fix things. So, all right, guys, have a good night. Taxation is theft. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the Capitol will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? Roads. <laughs> you boys like Mexico!